All right, good morning. Let's go ahead and open our Bibles to the book of Jude. Book of Jude. Um, I'm going to bring you more of a practical message today. If you're not sure where Jude is, go to Revelation and hang a left. It's right next door. Um, I wonder if anyone here has ever been in a situation that, that you looked at it and you said, can God, whatever, <laughs> you know, can God blank? <coughs> Can God help me here? Can God do this? You know, have, have you ever been in a situation like that? You know, and, and if you'd answer affirmative to that, you know, then it, it makes me ask the next question. I wonder if today you, even though you're in church, but I wonder if today you find yourself in a situation today that you're wondering, can God? And you're like, but Randy, we're Christians. Well, you're probably the one that would ask this as well. You're thinking about God. You know, and, and God is in your thoughts. And you're seeking Him and you're trying to please Him. And who would ever think that somebody, some saved, sealed, sanctified believer who's trying to read your Bible and, and pray and trying to please the Lord in, in some way, shape, or form, that you would ever have to say, Can God? You know, and um, so we, we look in the world with all its problems, and you can easily get overwhelmed wondering, can God? You know, you, you, you look at the war happening. You look at hunger. You look at starvation. You, you look at your country falling into pieces right in front of your face, and we say, can God? Can God do anything with this? You know, you think about broken hearts and shattered homes and sicknesses, and we ask, can God? You know, and if, if, if you think that may be too far from you, I don't want you to be too pious to say that you may never ask yourself, can God? Because if you've not yet been there, I'm telling you, it's coming. You are going to come to a point in your life you're going to face something, and you're going to say, can God, whatever, can he get me through this? You know, um, look at, uh, hold your finger in Jude. I should add you go to Psalm first. Let's go to the book of Psalms and go to chapter 78. And in Psalm 78, You're going to find um, a little history of Israel. And then we come to, in verse 9, the children of Ephraim being armed and carrying bows turned back in the day of battle. And uh, this is a part of uh, Israel. This is a part of God's people. Come into a point where they turned around and said, well, I think it was said like this before, I go a fishing. Yeah, you know, I think I've heard it put like that before somewhere. You know, and the fact is, just because you're a Christian, just because you're serving God, just because you have done a couple good things in your life with the Lord and made a couple right decisions, doesn't mean that you're not going to go through hardships. And that those hardships won't bring you to your very knees, having you even ask the question, can God? But as we see, and you already know it, without even going through the whole chapter, God went out of his way to show the children of Israel that he was there. You know, you think about being led by a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. They knew when it was time to move, they knew when it was time to stay. I mean, they're getting hungry, and food is appearing on the ground. I mean, they're at the edge of the Red Sea, and bless God, that whole thing opens up. God is like, I am here, I am here, I am here. And they're still like, can God? You know, and I, I think if any one of us would just take about 10, 20 minutes 
you could just go back in your mind's eye and just start thinking about all the miracles that God has done for you. And I'm not talking about Pentecostal fake miracles, okay? I'm not talking about you throwing the crutches because you were paid 20 bucks to, you know? I, I, I'm talking about the real miracles, that you were in a bind, you were in a situation, may, maybe it was emotional, maybe it was financial, uh, maybe it was physical, and you were like, I do not see any light at the end of the tunnel for this one, and God showed up and did it. And you're just sitting there like, no, really? And God's like, I'm here. In Psalm 78, 19, we see a question from the people of God about God. And it says, Yea, they spake against God. They said, Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Can God? I mean, you think about how great... I mean, they, got, they would get so mad at Moses and be like, Why couldn't you just left us in Egypt? There we have plenty of food. You know, and, the, and they're, they're kind of sitting back in their recliner, you know, I guess it'd be more like a tent peg or so. I don't know what the what they had, but you know they're sitting back on a rock or whatever, and, and they're they're saying, you know, those were the good old days back then, and they're forgetting how hard of a taskmaster Pharaoh was. You know, and they're forgetting, you know, in the world, yeah, you may have had your electric bill paid, but what were you doing to pay that electric bill? You know, and what type of person really were you? You know, what type of character did you really have? And isn't there a few reasons you can't drive down that street now, Christian? Because you, you may have treated those people a little bit wrong back in the day. And, you know, you can't go to this side of town because so-and-so lives there. And you got to avoid this store because there's that. Well, wh why, Christian? I thought all that's under the blood and over. Well, in God's eyes, it definitely is. But the fact is that you made some decisions back then, and it changed your life forever. And, and even though you were in the world, uh, you thought that you were going to make your own way. Um, you essentially were like, you didn't believe that God could, and that's what kept you from the Lord. You know, you didn't believe that... Now, I mean, maybe, maybe it was, for instance, we'll just put a, a general thing out there that I think a few of our folks messed with. We'll just put alcohol, okay, on the table. It's right there. Alcohol's on the table, and, you know, maybe you were in so deep, you didn't think anybody or anything, especially God, could get you away from that bottle. And here you are today, and you haven't touched that bottle in a year, two, three, ten, twenty years. I don't know what it is. But hopefully you didn't drink today, amen? But if you did, I mean, there, there, there is grace for the sinner, right? You know, there, there's, there's hope for the vile, like me. There's hope. I didn't drink today, but I got plenty of other problems. It's just alcohol is not one of them now, amen? amen? I didn't think I'd get such a loud amen on me having all those problems, but I, it's true, it's true. I'm not hiding from it. But that's the question. Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? So today I want to give you a message on Jude 24. Let's hang a left and go back there. And we're going to call this Can God. We're going to talk about God's ability today. As a reminder to us, God's ability as an encouragement to us, and God's ability as a sobering point for us. Now, we're in Jude 24. Well, you probably are, and I need to get there now. Jude 24, and it says this, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. So I'm going to give you three points on this verse. Number one, God's ability to prevent you from falling. In 
in there in Jude 24, you, say, you see it says, uh, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. I needed a P, you'll see in a second. All right, that's why it's still prevent. All right. Now, as think about this, as a growing infant, you know, is almost immediately raising their head. I mean, anyone that's had a baby, you know, that baby uh, for just a little while is just resting its head on its mother's shoulder and, and just kind of very limp. But very, very quick, that little baby is trying to lift its head, isn't it? And you're like, whoa. You know, and sometimes it happens so quick, they're like, this baby's strong, you know, because it's those neck bones. And I, I, I remember, you know, when, when Josiah showed up and seeing other babies too, like my niece, um, I remember they'd always say, oh, hold the baby's head, hold the, hold the, hold the head, they don't have muscles. And, and, you know, it's just like you can't even hold the baby. They're talking about the neck and the head because that baby has no muscles. But real quick, that baby is already trying to, like, lift up its head. And it's just something ingrained in that, in that baby. And th not long after that, we know it, now they're taking their first step. You know, and, and you don't have to sit there and tell that baby and try to convince them, you know, it might be a good idea, you know, if you lift your head, you know, and, and you give the, a big old class, you know, and you're reading in the Encyclopedia Britannica on, you know, all the reasons why it'd be a good idea for them to lift their head. You don't got to sit there and try to convince that baby. Maybe you need to take a first step. You know, it might be good, you know. Uh, you might get a little further in life if you take your first step. You don't do that. It's already ingrained into that little life, right? To lift their head, to take the first step. And as they're lifting their head, and you know what obviously happens after they take their first step, that baby takes a fall, doesn't it? And it's cute. And you try to catch the baby, but the fact is, the baby's going to start taking a fall as it's trying to walk, right? And that's just life, isn't it? Life is full of you learning and falling. Learning and falling. And learning and falling. And, and I mean, I, I've, heard, I've heard business speeches on this. It's like, failure is learning. You know, and some people, they will never do anything in their life because they are afraid to fail. My friend, you wouldn't be walking today if you were afraid to fail in that aspect. There, I, I can guarantee you fell more times than 10 learning how to walk, more times than 20, more times than 50. I mean, sometimes you get older and you start falling again. You see? I mean, that, it's just, does that mean you're going to stop trying to walk? No. You see, you need to be willing to get in a point where you are going to attempt great things for your great God. But what if I fail? What if? God will know my heart. God will know I tried. I tried to do something for Him. He knew what kind of mess I was when I came to Him. You need to attempt things for God. But God strengthens that little life's bones, right? He strengthens the ligaments. He strengthens the muscles. And that little child that was just taking its first step you know, a few years later, you can't get them to stand still. And they're running up the walls, down the walls, on the furniture, down the slide, you know, and they're, they're jumping on your brand new bed, and you're like, don't jump on my bed! Right, Josiah? He would never do that once. <laughs> he does it a million times. You know, and, and the fact is, God gets in that little life and starts to tweak things and change things and grow things. And the fact is, you as a parent, see, it was, it was odd for me, and I'm just kind of reminiscing a little bit, so go down this road with me if you don't mind. It was like, I felt like I had to be there for every little thing when he was such a little infant. And I had to be there because I felt like, in some aspect, I was in control of what was going on to him. And God showed me real quick, you're not growing this baby. I'm growing this baby. And man, I would, I would drive down the street and come back and Mary Chris is like, there was just this milestone that just happened with Josiah. And I'm like, I wasn't here for it. Like, didn't he know he should have waited for me? And God's like, I'm growing this baby, not you. 
You know, and then, I mean, I, c I could only imagine after they're a teen or in their 20s or 30s, it's just like, man, it's just like, wow, this little life that God gave, God is supplying, God is preparing, God is in their life doing these things, and it's a blessing. But God, as you are now a Christian, God is doing these things in your life, you know, in your Christian life. And maybe even as a new Christian, you feel like you're just trying to take your first step. And yet you just did a face plant into the edge of the stairs. And you came up and you have this big old bleeding thing on your forehead. And God's looking out like, oh, isn't that cute? And you're sitting there as a new Christian like, I'm such a failure. I'm never going to do anything for God. And God's like, yes, you are. Just calm down. Be patient. Let's stop the bleeding first. <laughs> you know, and just like a mom, you know, uh, uh, maybe get some ice and a rag and try to calm that thing down and try to soothe you. And now you're in the healing stage, even as a new Christian, right? This is life. If this is life in the physical, why wouldn't you think that this could be life in the spiritual as well? God is trying to grow you, stretch you. He's trying to... Uh, make those ligaments and tendons to grow stronger and stronger. So if you get the opportunity to lead somebody to Christ, or, or there's somebody walking around your town, God, God can tap you on the shoulder and know that He could send you because you're a faithful servant that's been tried and tested, and you've fallen and gotten back up more than once. See, God is not going to send somebody that's never fallen. He's not. They haven't been tried. They haven't been tested. They haven't been proved to stand. You know, that, that word prove, it always reminds me of David as Saul is trying to hand him his armor. And David as this young man is like, I haven't even proved these. What's that mean? I, I have not even learned how to walk in your armor, Saul. You're obviously too big for me. I mean, I can't barely slide across the floor in this. But you, as a Christian, need to be proved. And God needs to make sure that He can depend on you. So He's going to, just like any gym, some people in here like the gym, you know, He's going to start with a little bit of weight on the bar. And He's going to say, do a few reps. Oh, it doesn't look like it's much. I know. But do the reps anyway. Oh, but the guy over there, he's doing so much. I'm, don't you think I should go over there? No. No. I think you should sit here with these five, five pounders and do a few reps like I asked you to do. And some Christians, they're like, no. I'm going to go over here where it matters. And God's like, okay. <laughs> then they go over there and, they're, uh, 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 and they can't do it. And God's like, how about that? And then it starts getting cold, and, and they're like, God, are you here anymore? Yeah, I'm over here by the five pounders. Remember? Oh, yeah, the five pounders. You go back over there. Well, they might laugh at me if I pick up these five pounders, you know, but I might as well. And then you do a couple reps, and God's like, good, good, real good. Now do the six pounders. Six pounds? I'm sorry? Mary Chris, this is Roland. <clears throat> Six pounds? Oh, it's on? Okay. And you don't think it's very much, but between God and you, that's everything. That's all he's asking you. Look, I don't want you to go over and win the whole continent of Africa to Christ. Why? Because you're not ready for that. I want you to come over here by the five pounders at a little local church on some dusty road in the middle of Roseman and I'll lift some five pounders. That's it. Oh, but they're not, you know, there's ministries that are doing so much more. And yeah, I know, I know. But the one I put right by your place is that little five pounder. I want you to go lift it. Go see if you can do that. Well, that's easy. 
You know, it's, it's all just basic stuff. He doesn't talk about how many toenails the Antichrist has or nothing. I mean, it's all just salvation and just basic. And, and God's like, I know. I want you to go there, lift a few, and then I'll give you the six-pounders. And then I'll give you something else. And then I'll give you maybe your own ministry down the road. But guess what? We're not going to get there until you get the five-pounders. He wants you to start slow. And uh, God can do the same thing with you. Now, look at 2 Peter 2. Hang a left. Go to 2 Peter 2. And God is able to prevent you from falling. As long as you're honest with yourself and honest with Him. Now, some people are going to... Well, let, let's read the verse first. Uh, 2 Peter 2. Let me write that here. And let's look at 4 through 9. And it says this. It says, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world... But save Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, verse 6, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly, and delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. Uh, we're going to... Verse 9, for, the right, for that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexes his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Look at verse 9. And the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. You know, a lot of people, they're going to take that verse and say, like, see, Calvinism's right. He's going to deliver the wicked, you know, the unjust, they're going to get theirs, and whoever God chose to be saved, they're going to get theirs. You need to read it again. <laughs> you need to read it again. See, that, that's your problem. When you make up your mind before you open the book, you see what you want to see. That's your problem. You need to slow down, and like, like we were praying, see what saith the Scriptures, not what saith your theologian. Okay, that's still in diapers spiritually, by the way. You know, you need to see what saith the Bible. And look at verse 4 there, and you're going to see these angels. They are delivered to judgment. They're delivered to judgment. That's verse 4. You see it? says, if God spared not the angels, that what? What'd they do? Oh. Hmm. Now, now, who did it? The angels. But cast them down to hell and deliver them in chains to be reserved unto judgment. Now, these angels were delivered to judgment. Uh, you can go into uh, 1 Corinthians 11. And in 1 Corinthians 11, you find that angels have some kind of interest in females. And uh, it says, uh, let me see here. Shorter shaven. Yeah. Anyway, I know it's in here. Let's start at 7. It says, for a man indeed ought not to cover his head for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but for the woman, but the woman for the man. Which is a bunch of hate speech today, isn't it? Huh, isn't that interesting? For this cause ought women to have power on her head because of the angels. 
Now, I don't know of, a, of any type of bonnet that gives a woman power. I don't know about that. You know, what you're going to find in this is it is the headship of the man, number one, and number two, in verse 15, her hair is given her for a covering. Now, um, it says, Nevertheless, uh, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things of God. And I'm just trying to find this part here. It says, Because of the angels. Give me that verse. Did I skip it already? Ten. Thank you. And it says, for this cause ought the woman to have power on her head. Look at that, because of the angels. Run your verse reference to Genesis 6. Let's talk about the godly line of Seth that you don't find in Genesis 6. Now, it says in Genesis 6, verse 1, And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Okay? And it says, uh, and the Lord said, okay, so let's just park the car right there. If you do any basic fifth grade concordance run on the phrase sons of God, you know what you're not going to come up with? A godly line of Seth. Um, there's a few other problems with that. Um, let me see if I want to get into all that, really. Um, yeah, let's just keep reading. The Bible always says it the best, doesn't it? Amen? Now, it's, it says, okay, so let's just go down this road. And I'm going to prove it to you in a second that the godly line of Seth is not, quote, sons of God. Okay? Okay? Um, godly line of Seth is angels. Or I'm sorry, the sons of God in verse 2 is angels. Godly line of Seth doesn't exist. Let's just keep reading. Verse 3. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be in 120. There were giants in the earth in those days. Well, I wonder why. I wonder why. We have some weird hybrid race now. Half angel, half human being. And also that when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, that they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. Well, why would some other godly people have some superhuman race come out of it? That doesn't make sense either. Verse 5, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. It repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man, uh, man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and that creeping thing, and the fowl of the air, for it repented me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And what? <laughs> perfect in his generations. Why is that significant? Because apparently the whole human race had been corrupted by something. And you know what it wasn't? Any godly line of Seth. And it says, uh, Noah, Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. Verse 12, God looked upon the earth... And behold, it was corrupt for what? All flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. Where's the godly line of Seth? They're not there. That is a made-up figment of your imagination. What you have here is, let's go back to our text in Jude 24. Oh, actually, we're in Peter. Go back to uh, 2 Peter 2. We're looking at 4. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and deliver them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah. Why are we talking about Noah? Why are we talking about angels and Noah? Because there is no godly line of Seth. 
That's why only eight people made it up on the ark. How about that? I mean, wouldn't the whole godly line of Seth make it on the ark? <laughs> That's what happens when you follow your scholar. You're going to rest the scriptures to your own destruction with their help and assistance. Send them another check, too. But it says, uh, angels, these angels were delivered to judgment. Right? And uh, two, four, and it says, because these angels sinned. They sinned. They, they what? Let, let's not touch that yet. Okay? Then let's continue to verse five. We see Noah. Noah, uh, he was delivered from judgment. Now, you, you can look at the story of Noah. We're not going to do it today. I'm, I'm pretty sure everybody is fairly acquainted with the story. But Noah had to make some decisions in his life. If he was going to listen to God and walk with God, and he did. He didn't have to. He could have exercised his decision not to do it. I mean, the whole world wasn't. <laughs> I mean, he could have literally said, but God, everybody else is not doing it. You know, just like an 11-year-old, right? But mom, everybody else. Yeah, everybody else is going to hell. You want to go there too? You know, any loving parent is going to stop that kid and say, guess what? Don't worry about everyone else. Worry about you. Worry about what I asked you to do. I love you. I care for you. I feed you. I clothe you. I house you. How about those? <laughs> I mean, unless you want to go pay your own bills, that is, right? You know, you can always, you know, the door is right there. You can go out there and you can find out why it's so uh, significant <laughs> that I feed you, clothe you, do all these things. You know, I even buy your soap. You know, man, I could use that $3.50 for my gas tank, and I buy you bars of soap. You know, isn't that nice of me? Oh, nice mom, nice dad, right? And, you know... We know how that is. I treated my parents the same way, too. I didn't understand. I was telling them down below, I was like, man, I had an epiphany when I turned 18. I woke up in that bed, and I was like, my dad lets me stay here. And it was a weird come-to-Jesus moment. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I was like, so now it's like I'm looking at the trash full. I'm like, Trash is full. Maybe I should take that out. You know, like, I'll just take it out. <laughs> he lets me live here. And uh, anyway, so it was just an interesting moment. You know, I think. But the angels were delivered to judgment. Noah was delivered from judgment. Amen? In the ark of God. Which, think about what a bummer that would have been. You know, like, God, the whole world is having fun. The whole world's doing this. And you're going to sit here and make me work? And God's like, yeah, actually. Yeah, because I love you. But I'm sweating and I keep getting splinters. And, I, and God's like, yeah, you're alive. <laughs> you know, here in a few days, uh, they won't be and you will be. Now, let's go look at verse 6 then. It says, And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overflow, making them an example, or example, and sample, as the King James says, unto those that after should live ungodly. What does that imply? Uh, apparently Sodom and Gomorrah made some decisions. And they were delivered to judgment. They were condemned 
with an overflow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. Now, to think these people here were created to be that way, and that God said, you know what, you're just going to be Sodom and Gomorrah, that's your only purpose in life, and that God somehow would get pleasure from fire and brimstone coming down on any human. He doesn't get pleasure from that. They were making decisions. And God the judge looked at the angels and he said, oh, you made some decisions, I see. Okay, well, if A, then B. You're delivered to judgment. And God looks down at Noah and says, Oh, Noah, I see you're making some decisions. Well, if A, then B. You're delivered from judgment, Noah. And God looks down and he says, Oh, Sodom and Gomorrah, wow. Wow, things really got out of hand down here, didn't they? Wow, you guys are all making some decisions, aren't you? Well, if A, then B. You're delivered to judgment. And now probably the, one of the weirdest individuals you ever run into in the Bible, Lot. He's delivered from judgment. It says, and delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vex his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Now Lot is an odd fellow. But Lot shows up right here that he was a righteous man. Wow. <laughs> wow. Wow. But Lot, he needed a little help making his decision, didn't he? Some angels come into Sodom and Gomorrah and say, guess what, it's moving day. And Lot's like, really? I was just getting started. He's like, and they're like, no, you're just getting done. <laughs> if we're not out of here in a few moments, you're about to see a light, light show like you've never seen, Mr. Lot. It's time to move. And, you know, Lot's a really sad story. I mean, you could consider Lot kind of like a, a lukewarm, Laodicean Christian, halfway in, halfway out. And uh, it comes to a point where uh, uh, his family doesn't even believe him. And his wife is sold out on Sodom and Gomorrah. And it just gets, it, it's, it's a crazy story. I mean, the, if you thought the Bible was boring, you need to try to read it again. I mean, this, just, just the story a lot, it's a very interesting story but it's a warning. This is given to us as an example. An example. But he was involved with this. But he was righteous, just Lot. And because he made some decisions and he needed some help, just like me and you do sometimes. You know, me, me and Mary Chris, we listened to a testimony of some uh, tattoo artist that was recently supposedly saved. And we're looking into this thing and and uh, she doesn't want to leave her friend. And, and you know, it kind of made me in my mind go back to me. You know, and I was like, you know, I didn't really want to leave my friends either. You know what God blessed me with? Friends that were smarter than me. And my friend said, you're a Christian now, aren't you? Yes, sir, I'm a Christian now. They're like, you don't need to be in this band. Oh, no. No, I'm doing it for Jesus now. And they're like, no, you're out of the band. <laughs> you guys are so mean and hateful and judgmental. And I look back now, and that was God's mercy. Those, were, those guys, I mean, looking back now, God, that was God's hand. And God was using these unbelievers to help me on my way. You know, and because I was a lot like that. I was like, Oh, these are my friends. They stuck with me through thick and thin. But you know, they're not your friends if they're not sold out to Jesus. They're not your friends if they're not willing to open the Bible and pray with you when you need prayer. They're not your friends if, if they're going to let you live sinfully and not say nothing about it. 
they're not your friends. You know? And as much as we laugh, or maybe it irritates you to hear it, Mama was right. <laughs> but Lot, he was delivered from judgment. He needed a little encouragement, but he got out of there. He made some decisions. See, he could have told those angels, I ain't going. He could have. You don't think he could have? Well, then what happened to his wife? She looked back, right? She was turned into a pillar of salt. She exercised her free will that day. And if A, then B. So the point is this. Look at verse 9. We're in 2 Peter 2, 9. It said, The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations. Amen? And to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment. Amen? Amen? Amen. If A, then B, right? And the fact is this, is that uh, this deliverance is a result of the decisions of free will agents. See, some people will try to rest the scriptures to their own destruction and say, you know what, God created uh, these angels in Sodom to burn. And God created Noah and Lot to live. But all these people were exercising decisions. I mean, you know, it's just these conversations come up. Like last week I was telling you, I was just by the shed there. And all of a sudden I find myself in a conversation. And the guy's like, you know, she was created to be like that, Randy. I'm like, really? Really? What's the judgment seat of Christ and the great white throne judgment all about then? Who's on the stand? Is it God? Is God being put on trial? And God, how dare you make the angels in Sodom this way? And is that just? Is that unjust? And, and you know, there's people that teach that teaching, and they're going to say, you know, we may not understand it, but it's God's sovereignty. And, and this is just how it goes, because God is sovereign. And you, you know what? Get out of here. That word's not even in the Bible. It's not. No, it's in first and second opinions, you fool. <laughs> All these individuals were making decisions, and they got it. They got what they chose. And you, Christian, you will get what you choose. Right? It's, see, this is not rocket science. Otherwise, you couldn't be put on trial for it. If it was rocket science that only if you knew the most original uh, necessary constituent element of the language, right? God's not going to do that. Why? Because it'd be harder to judge you. You know what God does? He just says, you know what? I set before you life and death. Choose life. And he walks away. And, and, he, and it's, he's like this. like He's just watching. And you're sitting there and you're like, hmm, life? death. Life has a nice ring to it. But death, this looks, this looks more fun. Like everybody's having fun over here. And you're not even thinking about what you're saying. Just like, huh, you know, they're shacking up over here. They're fornicating over here. They're drunk. They're on drugs. Oh man, but the music's good. But over here, man, these guys are like boring, you know, and the, on the life side, you know, and uh, I'll go this way. And you know what? You start realizing this path wasn't as good as I thought it was. Man, it's cold and dark here. And what are these boils on my skin? And you know, and that sin starts to manifest in your life. And then you're like, wow, you know, I used to just smoke cigarettes because I thought it was cool. And now all of a sudden, I can't stop. And they're not $1.50 a pack anymore, by the way. <laughs> you know, and oh, you know, now, we used to drink this drink just because it was fun. It'd make us, you know, cut loose a little bit. And, but now I can't stop. And then you find yourself halfway down the road to hell, and you're on your knees crying, God, is there any way you could save me? I chose death. I chose death. Somebody give me an amen right there. I mean, I, I remember it. I don't know about y'all, but I remember that. I remember sitting there trying to puke myself over a toilet 
with, on a drug that you wouldn't sober up from puking from. It was just all I knew to do. It was so bad that I was like, man, if I could just puke, maybe I could just puke and just feel better. And it wasn't working. And I remember looking in the mirror, and I don't believe God speaks audibly today. If you want to hear God audibly, read the King James Bible aloud, okay? That's what I believe, you know. But God is he's not going to be speaking to me like out of a burning bush, but I had a heavy impression looking in the mirror. I, have a heavy, I had a heavy impression that day looking in the mirror, and I felt like God was like, what if I killed you right now? And I was like, don't kill me right now, God. I know if I go out like this, I'm going I'm to split hell wide open if I die like this. I was like, there's no hope for me if I die like this. Please don't kill me. Please don't kill me. Please don't kill me, God. And then you sober up the next day, and God's like, so what was that you were, what was that you were saying the other day? You know, we were joking at the other church about you know, prayer positions. You know, and, and some people, they, they pray like this. Some people like this. You know, some people like this. Some people, you know, kneel and all this stuff. And I say, you know what a legit prayer position is? It's like this. And, and they go. Anybody know what I'm talking about? That's on the back of a police car or the hood of a police car. That's a prayer position right there. And I, I, I remember praying like that, like, and, and it seemed like, I mean, I know the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and wisdom, but I had the fear of my dad that day. Like, my dad will kill me. Like, I don't even think I could call him. Like, he can't be my phone call. Like, my dad would probably be like, you better hope I don't see you. How dare you even call me? The next time I see you, you watch. Like, I was like, I, I couldn't even call my dad. So this is a prayer position right here. <laughs> and, and I joke about it, but the, the fact is, those were the worst days of my life ever because I was on the road to death and hell. And my dad was bringing me to church the whole time. What a shame. What a shame. What a reproach on his name. And I didn't even care about it. Why? Because I didn't know my Lord. I didn't know Him then. He didn't create me to burn in hell. I mean, I could tell you time after time after time, He gave me opportunity. Opportunity. Some brother knock on the door. There was a guy that would drive by my car and he would leave notes on the car to say, pray and read. That's all it said. I would get under such heavy conviction because he would see me at church. And I would get under such heavy conviction because I knew my life wasn't right. You know, if you're coming to this church and you're in sin, you should feel uncomfortable. Amen? If you're comfortable coming here, I'm not doing my job. Amen? 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 Amen. Amen. And, and I mean, that goes for me too. Uh, this stuff has to cross my plate before it comes to yours. You can't preach like this and have God not say, Thou art the man every now and then. Amen? Amen. And the fact is, we all got to swallow this bitter pill. Right. But guess what? You're making decisions, Christian. And if A, then B. Well, the Bible says it better. Hold your finger there. Let's go to Galatians. The dreaded text. Galatians 6. Galatians 6, verse 7. It says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. You know, what the, you know what it doesn't say? It says, a man, right? It says, whatsoever a man soweth. 
It does not distinguish if it's a saved man or an unsaved man. Right? That is the law of sowing and reaping. You heard of the law of what goes up must come down? That is the law of sowing and reaping. You're, you're going to take the time to plant that little seed and cover it and give a little water now and then? And God's like, I promise you, be sure your sin will find you out. I promise you. Oh, it'll be fun for a season. But guess what? You know, that little seed, when, when, that, when that crop of corn comes up, you get a lot more than you ever bargained for. Amen. Amen. And you may know nothing about it. Maybe you're like, Randy, you don't even know what you're talking about. Give it time. Give it time. Try it out. Try, try it out. Hey, if, if you don't got to get churched over it, we'll have you back. And even if you do got to get church over it, after you get right, we'll have you back. Amen. And that's because we love you. You know, we, we, we don't want to turn anybody over to the devil for the destruction of the flesh. Okay? Because that's all sin's going to do to you. Am I right? Yes, Randy, this is more of a lecture than a sermon. Well, maybe we needed it. Yeah. Maybe we needed it. But this deliverance was because of decisions that free will agents made. Now, in uh, 2 Peter 2.8... It says, uh, um, did I do this? Is it 1 Peter 2 8? Let me, let me look. No, it's 2 Peter. Two eight. I'm looking for where it says there. Is it 1 8? No. I did it again. I got, okay, where it says uh, their unlawful deeds in verse 8, verse 9, the unjust, tend them that speak of evil, evil of dignities. I know it's right here. I just zoned out. It is verse 8? There it is. Thank you. So 2 Peter 2.8. And remember, what I'm trying to prove to you is they were making decisions. In verse 8, it says, their unlawful deeds. Whose deeds? Theirs. Notice. Uh, verse 9, it talks about the unjust. It says, and to reserve the unjust. Well, how does somebody get to be known as someone who's unjust? They exercise unjust decisions. They're making decisions in their life. Verse 10, it says, uh, they are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Who? They. And what are they doing? They're speaking something. They're letting it cross their lips. They can care less about dignities. They can care less about who God put over them to rule and reign. They can care less about that. God puts those people in office like Nebuchadnezzar, God's servant. Huh. What? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. God knows exactly what you need. But he was a tyrant. Oh, he knows exactly what you need. And uh, it's, uh, I think this is 10. Let me see. I missed it. But anyway, somewhere in there it's going to say, who walk after the flesh, presumptuous are they. They speak... Okay, it's in 10. Thank you. Yeah, they walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government. Presumptuous are they self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. These people are making decisions, man. And God's up there like, is that how you want it? Okay. Have it then. You know, it's, it's like a parent catch, catching the kid smoking cigarettes, you know. And the parent's like, now you're going to smoke a whole pack right in front of me. And the kid's like, huh? Oh, yeah. Yeah, 
Go ahead. Here. Here, I'll light the first one for you. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Oh, he's like, oh, man, thing. I'm almost done with this first one. Good. Oh, man, this is pretty bad. And the parent's like, oh, here's another one. Here, light this off the last one, okay? And, okay, now smoke that one. And then after about the first three, four, five, ten, they start turning green. And they're like, I can't do this anymore. And, oh, no, no. There's a lot more here. You got to finish them. Remember, you're going to be a smoker now. Okay, here, have that one. No, no, they're, they're puking all over. The, that's what God does with your sin. And God's like, oh, you like that, huh? Oh, you need more of them. Here, take that and take that and take that. And all of a sudden, you are so disgusted with how your life, following the path of death and sin and hell, has turned out that you're begging God, can you please make it stop? Can you please make it stop? And God's like, well, you might need a little bit more. I don't think you're quite as disgusted as you should be. You know, like, it's, it is an interesting thing. Like, if you don't have an utter disgust for your life before Christ, you're going to go back. I, I mean, that's, that's what I think. Maybe that's my two cents. Three, three more cents, you got a nickel. Okay, but like me looking back, I'm like, you know what? If I wouldn't have spent the time to research what I did to God, and how about what God did for me, and what I did to God, I think I'd go back. But he has an ability to prevent you from falling. Well, Randy, I mean, we haven't been talking about it. <laughs> What's his ability then? Red flags. What is it? Warnings. What is it? The Word of God. What is it? Preaching at the church. What is it? Your parents saying, I don't think that's good. What is it? A police officer pulling you over. A police officer putting that light. Well, why are you out this late? Let me see what your eyes are acting like. We're going to go downtown. What is that? That's God's ability. You know, if you're not going to learn it in your parents' house, and you're not going to learn it in your own little apartment, and you're not going to learn it in a jail cell, you know where you're going to learn it? An electric chair. A Christian? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Or, I mean, if God even let you go that far, he's been known to just pull the plug on people for sin. For sin. There was, um, there was a young girl at a church I used to go to. I'm almost positive James would know, the family at least. And um, this young girl, church girl, she got on drugs. And I talked with somebody, and um, she had a testimony. This, girl, this little girl had a testimony but she just got walking down that road of sin. You know, everyone's doing it. And this little girl, she overdosed. She overdosed and died. And she was young. I mean, she was pretty. She was a pretty girl. She probably could have married anyone she wanted. You know, and God just took her out. There was no warning. You know, I'm sure her parents probably tried to tell her, we wanted better for you than this. And she's like, no, I think I'm going to go my way. You know, mom, dad, you know, I'm, I'm just going to go my way. And it'll be okay. Everyone's doing it, you know. And I, I know how much is too much. And all of a sudden, she didn't. And all, I, I mean, it makes you wonder what she's thinking as her eyes are rolling in the back of her head and she realizes there's no going back. Now, the tragedy is this. The preacher 
that preached her funeral, who's an utter fool, I can give you his name too if you're interested, but um, this preacher, if I understood it right, he tried to say that she lost her salvation. And he was trying to like iron it out at the, at the funeral. Now one thing I can tell you, you got a whole congregation of people wondering if she was actually saved. They're wondering. Now, I don't know her heart, but I, what I will say, if she ever was saved, she died saved. Yeah. Now, she lost her testimony. She lost rewards. She lost crowns. I mean, she lost her life. There is a sin unto death. And she found out what it was for her. Now, I don't know what yours is. God has dealt with me on a couple things that I, I believe He had to kind of draw the, the line in the dirt for me and say, if you go any further than that, you're about to find out what I can do to you. Because if A, then B. Now, Kent, Randy, can you prove that with the Bible? Not necessarily, but I had a heavy impression. And I'm not willing to go test it. But I don't know what it is for you. And the thing is this. They put the sign by pools. <laughs> no running by the pool. Right? Yeah, that's just common sense, isn't it? You don't want to act like an idiot. You don't, you don't want to do something dangerous that's going to bring you to the edge of eternity. We're just one more step and you fall. Randy, are you saying a Christian can lose their salvation? No, but I'm saying you can lose your life. And you can leave behind a family and a church and friends and loved ones that are wondering, did you ever really get it? What a shame, huh? What a tragedy to do something like that to your mother. That, I mean, as that mother lays her head on her pillow at night, does she wonder if she's going to see her daughter in heaven? You know, you don't have kids, so it probably doesn't matter, but you can laugh at it, maybe. You know, but once you've had a kid, once you understand life and love and family, you can't laugh at stuff like that anymore. It's not funny. Amen? Amen. <laughs> and it's just like, I don't even know if I'm going to get back to this message. I walked into a friend's room because I got a phone call, and my friend, who was in the punk band, he was going to slit his wrist. What is he typing out? He's typing out his little suicide letter. That's what he's doing. He didn't do it yet. I was happy. His mom, very old Hispanic lady, answered the door. Randy, como esta? And I'm like, hey, how are you? She gave me a hug. And she's like, oh, Mike's in the back. She had no idea what was happening in the back of her house right now. She was sick and elderly. And her son, who was in his late 30s, was still living at home, which is unnatural. Amen. Amen. Something's already wrong. But she felt, hey, man, there is a safe place for Miho right back there. He can have his room. I'll feed him, I'll clothe him, I'll buy his food, I'll do all this stuff. And I walk back in that room, and you could feel it in the air, the stagnant air. And I, I walk in, and he won't even look at me. Thank God he didn't tell me to leave. So I sat down, and he's just like this, typing out his little suicide letter. And I was just like, Mike, what's going on, man? He wouldn't talk to me. He's just like this. And I just tried to say, man, you, you got good things in your life, Mike. And I don't know what happened, but something came over me. And I was just like, Bro, 
what are you going to do to your mom? Like, who cares about the rest? Like, if you go ahead and you slit your wrist right here, what are you going to do to that old lady in the living room? You'd probably kill her. You'd give her a heart attack. Life is full of decisions, isn't it? Decisions that you can't blame on God. Amen? Amen. I mean, especially being in America. You talk about the land of opportunity. Well, she ain't what she used to be. This is still the land of opportunity. The reason you're in the boat you're in is because you've been making some decisions. Amen? Amen? You just ask anyone from a third world country. You can work as hard as you want here and make as much as money as you want to make here if you're willing to get, go out there and get it. And the reason you don't got it is because you're making some decisions, buddy. God is able to prevent you from falling if you're just willing to listen. Doesn't he always provide, what, what did he say? A way of escape? You're not even going to get them on that one. Well, I had no other choice. Oh, really? Let me show you door number one. <laughs> door number two. Door number 50. You had, you had some ways of escape. You just didn't choose to use them. And anybody who ever lived a little bit of a sinful life before you got saved... I, I'm pretty sure you can look back and be like, God tried to help me there. God tried to help me there. God tried to help me there. He tried to give me a way out there. And I wouldn't take it, wouldn't take it, wouldn't take it, even though I was getting really good at that prayer position. <laughs> He'd get you even in the position and you still wouldn't pray. God is all powerful. But he's not an abuser. God is all powerful. But at no point in time will he usurp your free will. Why? Because that would put him on the stand. If you're going to hang yourself, he's not going to do it for you. You're going to do it to yourself. And God's ability. He has this ability to present you faultless. We're back in Jude 24. And it talks about this very thing. Ver oh yeah, Jude 24. And it says, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless. Now, if you were to open up to Hebrews chapter 11, we, we refer to it as the Hall of Faith, don't, don't we? The Hall of Faith. You find a bunch of Old Testament saints. Let's, let's open up there. Just go there. Let's just take a little walk down memory lane. We're in Hebrews 11. And... It starts listing some names around verse 4. It says, by faith, Abel. Abel is a type of Christ in the Old Testament. And I was just trying to think, is it, do we have any dirt on Abel? No, you don't. You got any dirt on Jesus? No, you don't. Interesting. Type of Christ. Enoch. Well, Enoch is a type of uh, pre-tribulation rapture. You don't got dirt on Enoch either, actually. That's what happens to your sin, Christian. It's as far as the east is from the west. But as you get a little further down in this list, you, in verse 7, you find a man named Noah. We got some dirt on Noah. We, yes, we do. Horrible dirt on Noah. But look, you don't see any of it here. He prepared an ark. Uh, he condemned the world became an heir of righteousness, which is by faith. You only see good things about Noah. But I got dirt on Noah. You know, you, then Abraham. We got dirt on Abraham, too. He's a liar. 
I mean, amongst other things, but he would lie, 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 lie. Man, we, we have it all, but not here. He was called to go out into a place which he should have to receive for an inheritance. He obeyed. That's all we see about Abraham. 11, Sarah. Well, she laughed at God. She thought God was ridiculous. We got dirt on her, but not here. She receives strength to conceive seed, delivered of a child when she was past age. What a miracle! You don't have any dirt on her here. Um, go a little further down, we'll speed up. What about Jacob, verse 21? We got dirt on Jacob. He's a deceiver. He stole his brother's birthright, lied to his dad doing it, got his mom involved. You never see his mom really doing anything after she helped with that whole ordeal. God's just like, we're done talking about her. Joseph in verse 22, type of Christ. You don't really got any dirt on Joseph, do you? No? Type of Christ. But Moses in 23, we got some dirt on Moses. Mm -hmm. And Moses was a murderer. I mean, that's probably about one of the worst things, but he was an angry murderer. His anger would just keep popping up and popping up and popping up, but he's burying, man, he's, he killed an Egyptian and got away with it. He never sat in a jail cell for that. And here he is, Hebrews 11. But you don't see that here, do you? He refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures, notice this, of sin for a season. Then we come around verse 31, and we find an interesting title for a woman. I thought this is Hebrews 11, Randy. Right? We, we got dirt on these people, but it's not here. But look, something hung 